thank you so much for doing this and, and welcome. Um, we're uh, just for the folks that aren't familiar with you. Can you give us a little bit of background on, on what you do and where you're from? Uh, sure. Uh, thanks for having me, Sean. Uh, I'm uh, basically I was born and raised in Lebanon and uh, moved here when I was 18, around year 2000. Did undergrad in New York uh, medical school in Buffalo, New York. And then uh, moved to Houston in uh, 2008 for, uh, to Baylor. I did my residency in internal medicine. Then I did a fellowship in uh, kidney disease nephrology and uh, chose to become a hospitalist. I've been a hospitalist for the past, uh, since 2013. So that's uh, seven, almost eight years. Uh, as a hospitalist, I uh, take care of patients in the hospital. Think of it as a primary care of the patient in the hospital. Uh, all, all kind of acute issues. Um, and then, uh, uh, so that's basically what I do for a living. Um, how much, uh, how much uh, direct uh, nephrology do you do now? Or do you do much of that? So the uh, irony at the time when I, so when I did internal medicine, I didn't want to do primary care because I didn't want to deal with chronic diseases, which is the irony. I was like, I can't fix anything. That's, that's, that's not something I want to do. I did nephrology. I love the physiology. Then same thing. I don't want to spend my time running around dialysis units taking care of chronic diseases. So, uh, so I was like, okay, hospital medicine. There's acute issues I can fix. I can make them uh, better. So uh, I took the board. I got the board in nephrology, but never practiced uh, in real life. Uh, but it helped me a lot in terms of understanding general physiology. Uh, so I never really practiced, but I always thought about it and then just used it in my uh, clinical uh, experience. Yeah, it's kind of funny. I mean, you know, you talk about you don't want to take care of chronic disease. Uh, yeah, as an orthopedic surgeon, I, I was very much the same way because you saw how frustrated the primary care physicians were. And then as I got into orthopedic surgery, surgery I realized I was still taking care of nothing but chronic disease, but it was just the orthopedic version of it. And, and you know, you never get away from that. And as you know, in the hospital, I mean, all you're seeing is chronic disease exacerbations. I mean, acute, you know, I mean, occasionally you get some trauma or something like that, but it's, you know, and, and, and you know, maybe those are in the SICU, but you're seeing, you know, you know, people but, coming yeah. in with DKA and people coming in with acute respiratory illnesses that are all chronic disease underlying, right? Right. But then you feel that you're do, making a difference, like you're saving lives, you're, uh, you're doing, like the hospital is, is really a great place. It's the technology, the advancements, the, the stuff they do is fascinating uh, and it never gets old. But yes, the underlying, when you stop and think, and like this is at the end of the day, it's complications of things that we can prevent or reverse. Um, and uh, it ha I had to go through, through it with my own health to kind of see it, for the light bulb to go off and then you can't unsee it once you see it. And then you start having a, a you know, incongruency in your, how you feel and how, how you sh what you should do versus what you're doing. Uh, and that takes you on a path, uh, uh, you know, which took seven years to unfold. Yeah, that's the thing. Once you see something, you, you can't unsee it. And you put every, you kind of look through everything through a different filter, a different lens. Are you, did you, do you say, are you still in Texas? Yes. you like in Houston, Houston Medical Center area? Type yep, stuff? Texas yeah. Medical Center, yep. Uh, I mean, it's it's one of the best. I mean, it's an amazing place. Uh, I mean, the stuff, the uh, innovation here and all that. So I enjoy it a lot. Uh, and, and I think the hospital, but there's always constant increased need. The hospitals are always full. And then you realize it's not the hospitals are a consequence of our bad, uh, you know, uh, advice, uh, government uh, guidelines, all that stuff. We're just seeing the results and you have to deal with them in the hospital. And you don't have time to talk about diabetes or diet or anything like that. Um, and then, so you go back to fixing the issue, patching them up, sending them out, and then it's the same patients come and come. So they, they learn to know me more than their PCP because they come so frequently, uh, especially liver disease patients and heart disease and all these patients. So it's, it's sad, uh, but that's what it is, you know. That's one of the things that, that, you know, like when people talk about, you know, we're, you know, with the, with the COVID-19 stuff, you know, we have to keep the hospitals cleared out to take care of these people. But I say, you know, who's filling up all the hospitals or all these people with chronic disease that, you know, if, if you, you know, I, and I, I, you know, when I was practicing full time, I mean, it would be, 
you know, you try to get somebody admitted to your hospital and said, nope, there's no room. We're all full up with these people that are sitting there with their, with their diabetes complications. And, you know, so it's, it's not like your bad lifestyle doesn't affect other people because sometimes it does. It acts, it blocks their access to care when you have an acute emergency. And so I, I try to make that point that, you know, it's, it's, you know, your, your decision to, you know, abuse your body and, and it does affect other people's medical care. It really does. Um, let me ask you, um, so you've obviously come to the realization that food, nutrition, lifestyle has a huge role. How did you come to that realization? So, uh, you know, life doesn't make sense until you look at it hindsight. So in 2013, when I finished the renal fellowship and decided to become a hospitalist, just a few days before that, uh, I was, went to the mall to get the, some new pants. Uh, I'd landed on the dryer, but uh, it's not the 30 pounds I had gained uh, <laughs> over the previous eight years. So what happened, I, I bent to put my pants on and my back gave out. Um, I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you, Sean, but this is one of the worst feelings in the world. Actually, there's a worse feeling, which is 10 minutes later when really the spasm starts uh, hitting your lower back and you're paralyzed. So it took me 30 minutes to make it uh, past the mall to the car back home and somehow, you know, spent the two days on the floor. And then uh, I showed up to, I think my first day or so of hospital medicine with a cane. Um, and uh, I still have the cane, by the way, that cane <laughs> as a reminder uh, of, of what happened. So, but the long story short, for the next two years, I kept having these episodes of uh, back getting out and then being completely miserable. Um, and I was 30 pounds overweight, high blood pressure, pre-diabetic. And I kept blaming, look, I need to make it to the gym so I can get healthier. So every time I went to the gym, I, my back gives out and then I'm back where I started. I do yoga, I give out my, I mean, every, I mean, everything I tried, I was so afraid to move or lift a box for two years. Um, so th this is like, at the time I'm still like oblivious. Uh, then one time I was, uh, my wife walks in and I was on the floor. I, had, I didn't complain that time because I've complained so many times. So she looks at me and is like, okay. Uh, she throws at me the uh, Whole30 book. Uh, she's a very health conscious person. At the time, that was like 2014. Uh, keto and all that stuff was still not uh, very popular and I wasn't on social media. So when you read this book, do something about it, uh, what do you have to lose? Or do you have an excuse? So uh, I did the Whole30 for two months and I lost 20 pounds. I got significantly, felt better. Uh, my back was 80% better. Um, and then obviously like any human being, uh, I went back to my old habits and, uh, another flare up happened and then, uh, started doing paleo and then started experimenting and reading. Um, and then I heard about this crazy idea called keto and then, uh, I started reading and I was afraid of it. Like, why would I want to eat so much fat? You know, uh, after six months of following people on, uh, online, I said, let me dive into it. And I did that for a good three months solid. Um, I felt amazing Like I was, you know, checking my ketones, uh, uh, just doing eating like absolutely how it's supposed to be. And I felt great. Lost another 10 pounds. I'm down like 30 pounds by this time. Um, but then something happened, uh, that I kept getting this rash. Uh, I've heard of the keto rash, I guess. I, I researched the heck out of it. I couldn't understand. And I tried biosalt, the ointments, the stuff like that. It just didn't make sense. I was like, my body is telling me something that is something isn't right. Um, I was at a conference in uh, California at a, a metabolic health summit uh, in, I think, 2018 or 2019. And the guy there told me, you're not eating enough protein. And I never heard that before. I was like, okay. Uh, so I went and looked and start, this is when I started found, I found you and I found other people and I started learning and I started increasing my protein. I forgot about checking my ketones and things changed. The rash went away and I was like, okay, I stopped checking my ketones, I felt great. And I still dropped another uh, five pounds. And since then you become almost like a, a, you know, a, you know, disciple for this. You just like, everybody who wants to hear, I'll just start talking about it. Um, and to the point where you become annoying. Uh, and so that's what happened so far. And I evolved in the past year, learning from different pe people, uh, bits and pieces. And now uh, I'm more uh, pragmatic and I start where people uh, are and I'm very more, much more sympathetic to health and uh, where they start. 
Uh, so uh, there's no right way, I, I guess, but uh, there's general guidelines that I follow. How's your, how's your back doing now? What's I haven't you? had a, anything happen to it in two, three years. And I, by the way, the 30 pounds I lost was, I haven't, I didn't lift a single uh, weight. I was purely lifestyle. Uh, and then once I start feeling good and I realize, I, you can tell your body is much more uh, relaxed. It's not giving you warning signs. I start uh, exercising. And uh, this is uh, when I came across uh, uh, JT, Jerry Texaria on the, uh, uh, online and I like the idea of uh, body weight exercises and I got this uh, bar and started doing basic uh, combination of pull-ups, push-ups and uh, squats and kind of make it harder and this is I start getting uh, more muscle mass, getting leaner and I just and uh, my back never gave me any problems uh, since then. So. And, and so somebody's asking you know what does a day a typical week of food look like for you now what is your diet kind of based on at this point? Um, Right now, uh, well, since COVID happened, everybody gained weight except uh, the people who are eating at home, like with healthy. So I started uh, eating, uh, cooking more meat at home just because I liked it more. I didn't have time. Um, so I, basically what I do right now, I, I don't eat breakfast because I'm not hungry in the morning. I eat when I get hungry. It could be lunch, could be one, two o'clock. And then uh, most of the times I eat two meals a day. Eggs is a staple, uh, uh, especially like the early meal. Uh, and then I eat ribeyes, lamb, uh, all that kind of stuff. Vegetables, too. I like onions and garlic and like these extra flavors. Uh, and so mushrooms, so I include those. Uh, I would call it more of a meat-based whole food diet that is, uh, or lifestyle. Uh, minimal processed uh, and then uh, eat when I'm hungry and that, I mean, I keep it simple. And I get, and I, and I, I don't know, you know, my, I've got some people I know from Lebanon and they say it's a pretty, you know, meat rich culture. I mean, there's all kinds of different meats there. So it wouldn't be incongruent with, with how you grew up, I suppose, at least some of it. Yep. Yeah. Well, one of my favorite meals in Lebanon is a uh, raw sheep liver, which I posted once a picture. Uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's a common staple. The problem is it's, you could kind of have to have it with a piece of bread. So because it's a little, uh, but I uh, enjoy it. So definitely meat heavy, but since I grew up and now when I go back, obesity, I mean, the whole world is catching up and that's because the amount of bread uh, that's happening, I mean, it's crazy. And then with economic problems, uh, meat is getting more expensive and people are eating more uh, bread and dough and, you know, and then the Western the McDonald's everywhere there. When I moved, there was only one in Lebanon, you know. Yeah, that's uh, that's the trend. Is they want you to eat lower quality, lower quality food, which is you know l less nutritious and you know just more obesogenic, I suppose. Um, so you you said now, how tempted are you to try? I know it's tough in the acute hospital setting because people have a lot a lot of things on their mind besides you know, changing, I mean, they just, just, they just don't want to die while they're in the hospital. Right, right. <laughs> you know, so it's tough to make a, a big lifestyle change. I, 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 I sort of applaud the people that, that attempt to do that. And I find, I found as a surgeon it was also difficult because it really wasn't the, the ideal setting to discuss nutrition, but you do what you can. So how's it, how, how, have you tried to attempt to do that with some of the, some of the regulars you see? Cause you know, these people that come in again and yeah. again with cellulitis and, you know, whatever, diabetic, you know, yep. DKA exacerbations. Have you had any success with those folks? Uh, well, I knew that was the only thing I could do, which is uh, as a hospitalist, I run around for 12 hours. I don't have like patients, I don't have like 15 minute time slot. So once I take care of the acute issues, uh, patients, you can, you know, who's open, who's asking questions. Like some people, you know, you just, there's no point. Uh, then I go back and I, and I sit down with them and I talk to them. Uh, and you realize really people follow advice they're told. Uh, so we blame patients for eating too much or eating the wrong kind or anything like that. But a lot of times like I'm, I'm eating what I'm told to eat. Uh, and this is when I have to explain in, in simple terms how carbs turn into sugar, spikes your insulin and all that thing about insulin resistance. And when they see it, it's like, why doesn't my doctor tell me? It's like, you know, your doctor has the best intention, but they have 10 minutes and maybe they don't even know because I didn't know. Uh, so I, this is when some people take notes. I send them a website like dietdoctor.com uh, or tell them about podcasts or, or just general idea books. 
Uh, I mean, Jason Fung's book, I mean, this is, uh, for me, this is when I felt a slap on the face when I read it, like, how could be so ignorant while I learned everything in, in school, it just yet had a cognitive dissonance and just basically uh, for, ignored that uh, how physiology works. So I recommend books like that. Uh, I do what I can. Sometimes I don't see them again, so I don't know what they did. But randomly, I have a patient call me out from distance, say, Doc, I'm fasting and I lost 10, 15 pounds. I mean, they're still uh, very obese and they still have health issues, but they feel better. Um, so, uh, but one of the best uh, cases that I had that I felt I really made a difference. I really had a big shift. I had this lady who had uh, fatty liver disease uh, and to the point of, of bordering cirrhosis. Going to uh, liver failure, they're starting to work her up for transplant. And um, hepatologists are one of the few fields that actually believe in the fructose as a cause of a lot of insulin resistance and they start to uh, advocate fasting and stuff like that. So. Um, I felt more comfortable giving advice, but still I was more off the record advice. Uh, and I thought, oh, this is not medical advice. It's my personal opinion. You do what you want with it. And her husband had had the bypass uh, just a year ago and she was getting into uh, confusion from the liver failure and then his her liver numbers were horrible. I told him, if there's anything you can do, stop your sugar right now. And just one thing, stop your sugar, don't eat carbs. And then um, if the alternative is bad food, just don't eat. But they were so desperate that they actually just started doing it. Um, I was on service for two weeks. During those two, week, two weeks, uh, her husband refused to give her hospital food. They, they brought her whatever, if there's eggs that eat, whatever. And then she got into this basically phase of she got really confused. And I, I told the husband, I would recommend you stick to it. Um, and then I got off service and then I checked the chart uh, later and then she left the hospital. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. And then time has passed and actually last month I reached, I emailed the husband and said, hey, how are things going? He said, well, um, we're off the transplant list. Her liver has recovered 90% um, and everything is good. She's, she's the lowest weight she's ever been. Uh, and he's doing their, their run, they go biking and all that stuff. Her bitterly rubin, which is a liver number, uh, I mean, it was as high as 25 or something like that. Normally it's one. Right now she's down to two. And all she's done is uh, basically clean up her diet. Uh, so that was, oh my God, like one week with that patient with some messages and simple logic made, him, made, made a difference and saved that person transplant or maybe death and all that stuff. So this is when I started increasing that uh, advice frequency, whoever wants to listen. Um, and then COVID happened and then uh, just reassured everything I was thinking about or everybody was thinking about. Yeah, and that's truly amazing. I mean, and I, I've seen just countless people now that have had, you know, whether it's not non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or some other elevation in, uh, you know, their, their uh, liver function tests dramatically improved by going on low carb or no carb carnivore diets. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty consistent. In fact, there's a guy who's a, uh, he's a, uh, a bariatric surgeon and, you know, he puts all of his patients on them and, you know, he sees almost without any biopsies them all, all the livers when he does his, when he does his surgery. And he says without, almost without exception, when he puts them on the diet, their liver, their fatty liver resolves within a very short order of time, which is pretty it's, amazing. It's the quickest thing. It's, it's, that's the beauty, beauty of it. She was, her bilirubin was decreasing while in the hospital from admission 25 to discharge was down to 10 by just being on uh, basically no fructose uh, diet or no sugar carb diet for just a week. Uh, so yes, because that's the most toxic visceral fat, uh, the body is gonna get rid of it uh, first. And that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so definitely. So what now, obviously there's, I mean, there's a lot of people, you know, I guess maybe cardiologists being infamously the most likely ones that, that were really concerned about a higher fat diet. You know, you're going to, you're going to, you know, you're going to clog someone's cholesterol, the cholesterol in their blood is going to cause them to have a heart attack or the saturated fat, probably more likely is what they're, what they would say. How do you... I mean, have, what is your survey of the, of the literature at this point? I mean, there's been a lot of recent literature that maybe challenges that, but how do you sort of justify to patients or other people that, that sort of say, well, what about my cholesterol? 
Uh, I'm along the same lines as everybody in the community and we read the same stuff. And uh, so there's much smarter people digging into the research and writing the books about them. But my general opinion uh, is uh, fat is not making you fat. Fat is not causing you your heart uh, vessels to clog. And I, I make the analogy for them. Well, first of all, it's, it's, a, it's a fine balance because I don't want, I don't uh, contradict the cardiologist's uh, advice, at least uh, not officially. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, you have a study saying that and a study, I mean, you can have a, an opposing result from a different study, depending on how you look at it and your biases and all that stuff. So I, tr uh, I, I make sure uh, to stay uh, uh, more vague. But in general, I explain, which is a, everybody knows that, that uh, heart disease is more inflammatory disease. And then you have these vessels uh, that have uh, holes in them because of injury and insult. And then uh, plaques come with cholesterol and whatever to kind of patch it up like a wound um, and then uh, to heal. But the problem is the injury keeps happening. Uh, and I tell them, oh, we keep patching it, patching it, patching it. Uh, so yes, if, if you have a heart attack, you're gonna see cholesterol, fat, calcium, but it's like, uh, I read it somewhere, but it made perfect sense. It's like seeing a fire and blaming the, blaming the firefighter for the fire. Um, and then it's a blaze and more firefighters come, the fire truck comes and then the, the, the flames consume the fire truck and then they're part of the problem right now. They're basically fueled to it. So that's how I explain it to patients that yes, cholesterol is there. Yes, uh, it may be playing a role. It's, the problem is what's happening to the cholesterol rather than what the cholesterol is doing. So same thing with fat. Um, I told them we've eaten fat for millennials. That what we didn't do for all these uh, thousands of years is uh, eat the uh, highest amount of sugar and processed food and carbs. So the experiment has uh, happened in the past uh, 50 years. Uh, so, so that's where, where I approach it. Um, and I don't, I, you know, tell them, treat your diabetes, reverse your diabetes, and inflammation will improve. So I stay away from talking much about fat per se. I focus on lowering the processed food, and I think naturally a moderate amount of uh, healthy fats come into play. With your uh, nephrology background, a lot of people, you know, particularly when it comes to eating a higher protein diet, uh, you know, and certainly if you're including more meat in your diet than the average person, your protein is going to go up most likely. Do you have concerns about protein harming kidneys? Is there any? There's a lot of people out there that seem to believe that to be true. And I've seen, you know, I, I don't, but I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, so with the exception of end stage kidney disease, I think protein has zero effect on the kidney. Uh, the kidney is very good at uh, handling uh, protein. And that's what it's, uh, it's built to do. Um, there is, I've, I haven't seen, I've never seen it in my life that protein causing any, any damage of any sort. And there's no data to support any of that. Actually, if there's anything, every observation there or looked at has zero effect. The problem when you reach end stage renal disease or advanced chronic kidney disease is the kidney is sick, so it cannot handle the protein. It's not like the protein is damaging the kidney. It just can't process it. And then you start having what we call uremia and then advanced, more progressive acidosis. And uh, this is when you start talking about dialysis to, re uh, to replace the kidney function. But absolutely, uh, uh, in my opinion, there's no um, evidence that protein damages the kidney. You just have to be careful if you have advanced kidney disease. And then what about uh, like advanced, you know, like you, you mentioned this patient that was nearly cirrhotic, uh, you know, probably NASH or something along those lines. Um, Cause there's some concern about um, ammonia handling, you know, because you know, if you're, if your liver, obviously your liver is going to convert ammonia to urea and so you can clear it. But is there any concern with really, really dramatically advanced liver disease that protein would be a problem? So interestingly, when I was in residency, uh, hepatologists, liver doctors uh, recommended lower protein diet. But over the years, the research, uh, at least based on their opinion, that has changed. And now they actually recommend an increased protein intake because sarcopenia is one of the uh, worst predictor of uh, poor outcome. So um, actually they encourage these patients to eat more protein. Um, now the amount of protein, obviously we're not talking about like uh, bodybuilder type amount of protein, but definitely a good amount of uh, protein and dietitians also, uh, you know, start helping with that. Uh, so I don't, yes, the problem is just metabolism. It's anything, ammonia level, 
I don't know if ammonia per se is the cause of uh, the confusion versus it's a byproduct. This is a surrogate we're looking at. Um, and this is when we give them uh, lactulose, which basically you force them to have diarrhea. And then you, you pull a lot of these toxins from the, from the body. So I think it's just a combination of things, not just protein. It's just uh, an inability to metabolize nutri nutrients. And then you get the toxic uh, uh, byproduct. It's not really uh, what, what it's supposed to be. So in the hospital, I mean, you're, you're dependent upon, you know, the, the hospital dietitians and, and, the, and the cafeteria, what they'll feed. Are, are you able to order a low carb diet in the hospital? Very uh, I mean, I that... There's no such a thing as a low carb option. There is low fat, low cholesterol, which is, uh, I always cringe when I see it, uh, especially because what that means is usually a high carb uh, uh, pancakes and a muffins a diet for heart disease patients, which uh, I mean, I'm speechless, it's, it's, it's comical. Uh, but that's not um, my hospital problem, this is just a, a world uh, problem. Uh, when it comes to diabetes, there's something called carb control, but there's still carb control by calories. So it's like 2000 kilocalorie carb control or 1800 uh, or 2200. Uh, so when I ordered them, but I go to look at the tray, it has like a tiny little bit of uh, scrambled egg, maybe one piece of bacon, and then two biscuits, uh, uh, juice. And I mean, I, I, I kind of gave up and I, I think people have good intention. It's just that that's what life is and I have to work around it. And I asked the patient, look, this is a menu. These are things, order more of this, less of that. And uh, don't expect to get healthier in the hospital. We want to take care of the acute issues. Just that when you go home, these are the things that are, you want to avoid and uh, eat more of uh, the healthy stuff. Yeah, it's interesting they have the, you know, the sliding scale to go with the pancakes, you know, yeah. the insulin sliding scale. And it's, 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 you know, I remember just ordering that before I knew any better. It's like, oh, okay, I got to put these people on the sliding scale. And, you know, if yeah. not, the nurses would, the nurses would hassle you if you didn't order a sliding scale, because then they would have to sit there and, yeah. you know, try to figure out the insulin dosing. It's like, maybe we didn't give them the carbs, they wouldn't need the, need the darn insulin. Right. But then in the acute setting, if I don't give the insulin, uh, I'm going to deal with complications of hyperglycemia. And then and, and it's, it, so I, so I choose my battles. At that point, I, I have to give insulin. Uh, I, I knowing that I'm not, I'm adding to the problem, but in a key setting, I'd rather them alive and get out of the hospital than uh, add to the problem. Um, so some patients actually listen, and I even in the hospital, I'm able to decrease their basal insulin almost in half within a couple of days if they're motivated and I trust them. Uh, and then they give them the advice: if your sugar is so low, you can refuse the insulin. If you, I don't want you to plummet. My biggest fear is hypoglycemia, low sugar, which can lead uh, as far as death, seizures. So I really have to be careful because uh, at the end of the day, I'm responsible uh, for their care. So I'd rather them run a little bit high sugar uh, rather than run low and give them the education to start uh, at least thinking about it. Yeah, this is a, one of the, the biggest things. I think one of the biggest impediments is, you know, because people are so concerned about hypoglycemia. And as you rightly point out, there are people that can get very sick and even die from hypoglycemia. Uh, but what I think there's some decent literature out there showing that higher fat diets tend to lessen the incidence of hypoglycemia quite a bit, actually. And to, to some cases, if you look back at some of the early trials prior to, you know, prior to the, in, to the, to the sort of the utilization of, a, of insulin yeah. before it was invented, they, they didn't have hypoglycemia to any significant degree when they put them on high fat diets. So, it's, it's interesting, but then everybody's scared of the fat because they think they're going to have, uh, you know, these problems with heart disease in 20 or 30 years, which I think is frustrating uh, uh, about that. I, one of the problems I have is people are worried about, I mean, you've got this patient acutely in front of you and, and many and the primary care physicians also, they've got their, they're in there complaining of some illness and we're trying to prevent them from dying in 50 years, which I mean, why don't we just take care of the patient in front of us and, and relieve their suffering today. That's what they're yeah. here for instead yeah. of like, you know, trying to tell them how to, how to, how to live their life and that type of stuff. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Talk about, so in diabetics, um, I mean, I would assume that would be the, 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 everybody would, I mean, there's even some literature out there that's suggesting that 
ketogenic diet, low carb diets definitely have some good support behind that. So are you, are you on, do you feel like you're on more solid ground with the diabetics? And then is there anybody else in your, your sort of professional circle that's on board with you? Or is there a little group of guys in the medical center uh, that are low carb? So I think uh, low carb people tend to be this uh, silent army. Uh, like you don't know who they are until suddenly you discuss and you can tell from the conversation uh, uh, what wavelengths they're at. So there are a couple of colleagues that, are, that, are, that believe that uh, and they, they practice it themselves. And then, uh, and I know because I see the progression and nurses comment, hey doc, you look like you lost a lot of weight. You look good, you know, what, what's, what's happening? And then, and, and then you hear that, you know, they, they, they're cutting carbs or sugar, but they kind of keep it to themselves. Um, I, again, in the hospital, it's just uh, very hard to make a uh, big difference because we have to treat the acute setting and just plant the seed for the patient. But I think there are some uh, people starting to kind of, you know, uh, give advice to friends and family and things like that, just to kind of uh, make a difference. And they're happy about that. Um, and some patients are asking questions um, and starting to doubt uh, the general advice, conventional advice. For sure. Yeah, you probably could find, you know, by going to the cafeteria, you could probably spot the other doctors or the doctor's line and spot the other doctors that are low carb pretty quickly by what, what they got on their, yep. on their plate. Because it's interesting, <laughs> most of them have done it themselves. I think almost with rare exception, the physicians that practice low carb within their practice have done it themselves. And most of them are formerly people that were pre-diabetic or overweight. Yep. And they, they make this discovery themselves and then they become converted, which is... The, the saddest thing, I know like we blame doctors and hospitals for being malicious and have ulterior motives, but really I think people are doing what they believe is right. Because when you look at doctors and cardiologists and when they go to the cafeteria or to the physician lounge, what they're grabbing is uh, apple juice, a muffin, a banana. Uh, I mean, to be fair to them, they don't give you any other option. It's usually a granola bar uh, with a heart healthy uh, stamp at it, on it, and then that's what they eat. And then if they're metabolically unhealthy themselves, I think it's, I don't imagine they were going to give that advice uh, to people. So uh, I see it, I keep it to myself, but oh, what can I do? I mean, you can get, you can lead the horse to water, you can make him drink. So. Yeah, I know, I know there's, and again, where you're at, it's one of the biggest medical centers in the world. So a lot of, a lot, it's a, it would take a lot to turn that system around. I know uh, like, uh, Mark Kukazel out in, gosh, I think he's in South Carolina, if I'm not mistaken. I know he was able to convince his hospital to start adding low carb diets to- it's a very to, small community hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah small yeah. community type thing. But maybe that's where it's got to start one at a time and do that type of thing because it is, uh, uh, you know, hospital is not a place to, to, to get healthy. I, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's a place where you can stop dying, I guess, temporarily. <laughs> But, you know, it's not really set up to make you real healthy. I mean, it definitely so. saves your lives. I mean, yeah, these sure. advanced heart, like the LVAD, like when people with advanced heart failure, uh, the stuff they do to be, keep people alive and get a heart transplant and see them survive, the liver transplant, kidney transplant. So definitely, like, uh, a lot of miracles happen. But it's such a, a huge financial and uh, personal cost. Uh, but you have no other option. You're already too late. So you have to do these things. Uh, my wish is to kind of go back and then be able to prevent that 10 years before that, even sooner, because right now I'm seeing, uh, you know, guys younger than me in their early 30s, 30s getting bypass surgeries. Um, and then they have all the, well, I'm healthy. Uh, yes, they don't know that they're, they're actually trying hard. Like I'm, I'm running, I'm, I'm eating, uh, I'm not eating fat. And I'm, they, they tell you that's with good like, intentions. And that, and then they're, overweight, they're pre-diabetic or diabetic. So they never get labeled as having anything else. And then obesity or weight uh, has become, we're just basically blind to it. Everybody is so overweight that they only notice people who are thin instead of, <laughs> so uh, they only, you get a comment when you're actually in shape rather than uh, give advice when people are uh, metabolically unhealthy, you know. And, uh, and, uh, and they can't blame the patient. They're really doing their best. They're just getting the bad advice. Yeah, somebody made a comment about GFR. You know, you know, it's, it's an estimated, obviously, it's estimated GFR. 
Um, I often, you know, particularly with high protein diets, will often see creatinine go up, the UN grow up, and that's alarming to some people. And then that GFR calculation is just based on that serum creatinine. Um, do you, are you familiar with uh, cystatin C and is that something you've ever looked at or utilized as a something? Uh, it's used diet? more um, in, uh, I guess, more on research uh, settings. I haven't uh, clinically, it didn't really, at least at the time I was doing it, it wasn't really being used, but it's uh, something. I, I mean, creatinine is a reflection of muscle mass too. So, Yushan, if you, you creatinine, if it's 1.3, 1.4, probably normal. Uh, I, mean, I, I mean, I'm giving general, uh, est, uh, you know, assumptions here, but uh, a lady, a tiny lady in her 80s whose creatinine is one, uh, maybe in like CKD, chronic kidney disease stage four. So, so it's, uh, it comes with its own uh, limitation. So you have to, so GFR, it's a, it's a formula at the end of the day, and then you have to look at uh, age, muscle mass, and all that kind of stuff. So, Yeah, that's what, that's what I've pointed out. Like, you know, if you've got a big muscular guy who eats a lot of protein, and they have a lower GFR and, and a high serum creatinine, it's probably because they got a lot of muscle and they have a lot of protein in their diet. Not to a certain a, extent, yeah, because yeah. It, like 1.3, but when you start going higher than that, then you have to think about it because a lot yeah. of these uh, muscular guys, are they eating traditional like advice, like loading up on carbs? Are they really taking some supplements that are hypertension? I mean, if their blood pressure runs high, and they're diabetic or whatever that they don't know about, that can put a lot of tax, uh, can tax the kidneys and you can have underlying chronic kidney disease from that same uh, chronic inflammatory state. So, um, so it's definitely worth uh, paying attention to, but you'll know in, right away based on the person if this is normal or not. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of people that don't understand. There's, there's That's why you look at the patient in front of you. You get a lot of people that randomly send in labs it's like what do you think i'm like well i have no idea because i don't know anything yeah. else about you and you gotta you gotta be able to put this into context um you know i've had some people that you know they, that were you know they were they were concerned because their gfr numbers were lower creatinine was high and i actually i had them go get a cystat and see and, and basically it comes out normal and i think yeah. that's that's kind of an interesting uh interesting point you mentioned a little bit about blood pressure one of the things that uh a lot of people in the low carb community will recommend is, uh, particularly during transition periods, a lot of sodium because, you know, as you know, the, the, the in insulin, you know, tells us to, you know, keep sodium and water around. And, you know, when we cut insulin, we have a relative naturesis, so we lose that fluid and salt. But some people um, I've seen, and my suspicion is, you know, they, they tend to eat a lot of salt and then they keep doing it out for the long term and, and some have seen high blood pressure do you think do you think there's still some uh, issues with salt and blood pressure um so i recently mentioned it in a tweet before uh, so salt so high blood pressure is a result of salt and water retention but it's not salt that is causing the salt retention it's more the signal that's telling the kidney to keep absorbing that salt and honestly, throughout my training, I never, I never even, I don't remember learning that insulin caused uh, salt retention in the kidneys. I learned this more in a recent and it made perfect sense because all my diabetics and high amount of insulin, they're swollen, uh, they have high blood pressure. So it makes sense. That, I mean, the insulin, from what I understand, works on the, it's a hormonal system, renin, ng, uh, angiotensin, and aldosterone system. Aldosterone mainly is a mineral corticoid that uh, tells the kidney absorb salt. Um, and then if that is on, uh, no matter what the kidney's intention is, the salt uh, gates are open. So when salt comes in, water is going to follow. And then intravascularly, um, you're going to have more salt. And then insulin also causes uh, vascular resistance, uh, intimal thickness. Uh, I lost your... Uh, oh, I was yelling at my dog, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, in, so insulin is driving salt absorption. So people in early stage, I tell them, be careful first because you're still in a high insulin state. So if you start e increasing your salt right away, you may make your blood pressure worse because you're just going to drive it. So it's a, dan it's a dance, it's a balance. Um, monitor your blood pressure. Before you add salt, um, start decreasing your blood pressure medicine 
uh, and then go with that. And over time, I think if you're insulin sensitive, the kidney is going to take care of itself. Uh, obviously, the, dose, the poison is in the dose. You can die from water intoxication. So uh, if you eat 20 grams of salt, I'm sure something is going to happen. But uh, salt to taste, if you're not cramping and you don't have headaches, I think you're, you're right there. Yeah, I think that's a, I mean, that's a pretty reasonable, I think we do have these sort of natural feedback mechanisms. And I, I often parrot that as well as say salt to taste usually, usually does it for most people. You know, like if you're going to go out and sweat for two hours, exercise, and maybe, maybe you, you up that a little bit, but I mean, generally that's, that's, that's what I found to be pretty effective for most people. Um, yeah, one of the, I guess that's a, that's a good point because you talk about these the diabetics and you often see them with pitting edema around their legs and feet and they get these this bronze diabetes and their skin starts to slough off. And, uh, you know, you see, I guess, with higher and higher increasing doses of insulin. And so that might, you know, that certainly might be the part of the mechanism there, I would, I would suspect. Definitely. What have you... Uh, um, have you had uh, uh, sort of any? Uh, sorry, I've got a little phone weird acting right there. What um, have you been surprised with the most by by changing diet? As far as anything, you you know, I've seen some really bizarre things, like people with Ehlers Danlos stop dislocating their joints, which to me was just totally shocked because that's a genetic disease. Have you seen anything respond to? to diet that you would have sort of not thought it would have done? Um, the most thing is these chronic aches and pains that are not particularly attributed to anything. Like lower back pain for me was, uh, didn't make sense. Uh, I mean, I, I kept going physical therapy, getting x-rays, but going low carb fixed that. So I don't know why migraines, I've seen people that headaches uh, go away. Um, uh, you know, I haven't treated a lot of like advanced uh, uh, diseases to beyond the, the typical diabetes to know, but a lot of people, uh, just a lot of GI issues just go away. Um, uh, you know, high blood pressure goes away, but in terms of unusual things, uh, uh, I haven't uh, had enough volume to tell you exactly what, uh, what, what might happen. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've had the fortune to, to see now tens of thousands of people, so I've seen some uh, really uh, interesting things. Uh, somebody's asking about, uh, I guess, a myth of, you know, you need X amount of water per day, two and a half liters or something. Is there some, we need, have to have a certain amount of water every day or we, where bad things happen to us, or is that just based on nothing? I don't think the caveman had to, was measuring his water uh, back uh, 5,000 years ago, just to kind of make sure you get enough water. I think you drink when you're thirsty and you drink until you're satiated for water. Same with food. Uh, so I, I, I like to keep it simple. I mean, <laughs> uh, drink until you're not thirsty, eat until you're not hungry. Uh, don't eat if you're hungry. So it's the same principle. I, I, I don't, there's no formulas, uh, in my opinion, for water or anything. Uh, your body is smart enough to tell you when to stop. What, I mean, knowing what you know now, I mean, are you thinking of, you know, I mean, plugging away as a hospitalist and keep trying to fight the good fight there? Does it ever tempt you to say, I'm going to shift things up a little bit? What are your, what are your thoughts? I feel that I'm making a difference as a hospitalist and I, because I think there is need more for more hospitals uh, similar to me and in, in the local community to start planting the seeds to for these patients to go out and talk to the primary care doctor or even find low carb uh, friendly doctors to really make the change. So I, I don't want to lose that uh, footing in terms of making a difference, especially people who, are, who don't have much time and they need to act fast. Uh, but as a hospitalist, I have a great uh, life uh, work balance. Uh, you work seven, on average, seven days on, seven days off. So on my time off uh, and uh, since COVID started and realized how urgent um, uh, metabolic uh, health is important, uh, I started uh, doing some coaching on the side, uh, mostly online, and then, um, you know, walk through uh, people through, uh, basically, through the process. Uh, and then I'm not following a specific uh, guideline except a general map and then start where they are in life and then make progress and then evolve 
so that's what I've been uh, starting to do besides hospital medicine. Yeah, we've mentioned COVID a couple of times. And one of the frustrations I've had is kind of our lack of acknowledgement of how, I mean, it, we're starting to see a little bit of that now, but I mean, even from the beginning, I mean, we've known forever that people that are poor hosts that have underlying comorbidities always do worse in any infectious disease or, or acute trauma or any, any, really any illness. And, and, you know, it, we, I just, it just sort of shocked me that we put so much em emphasis on social distancing, masking, shutting down things, not, you know, and that's controversial whether you think that was a good thing or not, but regardless, the fact that we just kind of just blatantly ignored chronic disease and, and, and feel there's nothing you can do about it. Is that still the sentiment in the medical center? Did, 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 did the Houston Medical Center get overrun with COVID cases where they couldn't keep up? Or, or are we starting to look at maybe can we improve these host factors so we, we have better outcomes? Again, as a hospital, you're not built uh, as a business model to treat, to kind of prevent these things. You, you, things hit. I mean, when it came, it came in, in, a, in a huge way. We, we came close to saturation, but we never got there. But when somebody's already can breathe on a ventilator, uh, you just have to manage there. Uh, and then, uh, and it, it was very predictable. Uh, you know, and you start warning people, like you can tell from their medical profile who's going to get worse. And it's a, it's a train that is coming from 10 miles away and you see it because they don't get sick right away. They get sick five, a week or 10 days later. And this is when the inflammatory marker, their CRP shoots up to like in the upper 20s uh, from, from normal. And then you know uh, things gonna happen. Uh, so it's known and they all talk about it of that as a risk factor and they expect that they are gonna do po more poorly. But what can you do in the hospital, you know? Um, you can't reverse their metabolic condition right there in the hospital. But I do warn patients who make it out, uh, you know, with relatively a minor illness, that that's the risk factor. And then if you have family members, uh, it's a matter of time we will all gonna get the virus or be, uh, you know, exposed to it. Uh, you may not have the illness, you may, you may end up in the ICU. Just the only thing you can do, what is under your control right now is really fix your health. Um, I did send an email once uh, out of when I was seeing the numbers to one of the VPs at the, uh, at the school uh, and tell him how we're talking about all this stuff, but we're not talking about the elephant in the room. And he acknowledged that, but the, the, the answer is always, uh, what can we do right now? And now that was early in the course, but right now, six months later, uh, in, in theory, you could have reversed everybody's uh, <laughs> metabolic illness if you, if you put them on the right uh, lifestyle. Um, and some people made that difference. Some doctors I saw them out there, they understand that and, they, and then they took care of their own health. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, as you've seen yourself, I mean, they're within, sometimes within a few days, I mean, these people lower their insulin requirements, yep. their hyperglycemia improves. Um, what, you know, there's some people here that, you know, like, I mean, we're routinely, you know, uh, when when people come on on in a hospital, you know you, you you hydrate them, you stick a bunch of dextrose in them. Do you have any thoughts of that, uh, as far as you know, you know fluid and electrolyte resuscitation uh, with with just dumping a bunch of sugar in, into the people's veins? Is that a problem these days, or do we need to, um, do we need to rethink that? Uh, we definitely need to rethink that. I'm more of a I'm the guy who goes around stopping medications that are unnecessary and. Uh, changing the IV fluids from dextrose to normal IV fluids. Uh, the biggest fear, and for some reason, is God forbid they have uh, no calorie intake for, for six hours. Uh, so if people are not eating MPO for procedure and I see somebody have them on dextrose, I just quietly change the fluids and I don't make a big deal out of it. I just uh, change. I know they're well intentioned and just remove uh, the dextrose. Um, and so definitely, and I have seen, I'm seeing less and less of it, but, uh, uh, it's still being used for sure. Yeah. I mean, that was a go-to when I was, I mean, it was just, you know, and it's interesting because, you know, God forbid they don't get in flooded with glucose for four or five hours while they're NPO or something like yeah. that, you know, because yeah. they, you know, it's that you want them to be you know, a little bit hungry for. <laughs> my uh, my uh, biggest uh, concern still is TPN, which is total parental nutrition. And I've been interested for people who have like messed up guts, they can't eat. Uh, that I haven't been able to make a big dent because the primary uh, energy intake in that bag is 
200, 250 grams of dextrose in that alone, a little bit of fat. And then when you look at the fat composition, you think, oh, there's a, you know, a, a short chain fatty acids, great. But then you see soybean oil too in that, in that mix. Um, and protein, they, they hit the protein target, but then I look at the TPN, I try to work with the dietitian, like, can we just, let's lower the energy from carbs and increase a little bit more from the fats. And we'll watch it regular. I mean, I just have to, I choose my belly. If I, if I drop by 20 grams, 50 grams, I, I feel like it's a win in the long run. A lot of these patients are diabetic or, you know, a lot of issues with that. Yeah, I, I guess I haven't looked at TPN because I just don't have, I don't run into it these days, but I, I didn't realize that the primary fat was soybean oil. It doesn't surprise me. I don't want to say the primary fat, but it's part of it. I think, uh, especially recently, there is a, there's both for sure. I, I, I've seen it. And then the two feeds, I mean, uh, you just have to look at the bottle of Insure or all these two feeds and see what's in them uh, to realize uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't feed it to my family, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at the insure stuff, and I, I wouldn't feed that to my my dog on a on, yeah. a, on a on a bad day. But uh, that's that's a, that's a little bit uh, uh, concerning. Um, Eli, well, it's we've we've almost covered an hour here, so I wanted to say again, once again, thank you for doing this. Again, it's good to see more physicians that are. Uh, you I appreciate know, you inviting me. Doing this into their practice, where uh, if people want to follow you, and, and and if people want to hook up with you for a coaching session. Sure. How do they? Uh, how do they get it? And get about, how do they do uh, that? I'm active uh, recently since June. I'm active on uh, Twitter. Uh, it's uh, Elijah Rouge MD. Uh, I'm starting trying to figure out what to do with uh, Instagram, but I I want to make sure it's uh, va uh, value added rather than uh, just copy things. So I, well, maybe in the future. But I have uh, my website uh, metabolichealthmd.com. You can look at my thought process about my approach. Uh, I, and I do basically my coaching is, uh, is basically metabolic disease programs, whether it's uh, met uh, medical weight loss or uh, the diabetes reversal or even individual session if you want. Uh, but uh, spectrum is all of it from autoimmune to all of it. But my, my passion is more like fatty liver, diabetes, obesity, and take you through the journey. Um, just a caveat, I'm, so far I'm only licensed as a medical, as an MD in Texas. So anything outside of Texas is uh, coaching. Uh, and then uh, advise me. And then if you need my help getting off medicine, uh, you'll have to be in Texas. Uh, but other than that, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to help. Just uh, reach out through email, through uh, the, there's a form there. You can reach out. Uh, I can talk to anybody uh, for a good 20 minutes and then see what they need and see if you're a good match. Yeah, that's great stuff. And, and I just, I, the one comment I want to add is, you know, the deprescribing aspect, you know, that's something that you, you, you do need a physician to do that for you. It's still yeah. medical care, but that is a skill that many physicians don't have. I mean, most physicians, they put them on meds and they don't know how to get them on because they never expect them to come off meds. 20. I, I always discontinue about 20% of patients' medication less in just a few days in the hospital. So small wins. Yeah, and there, then their primary care physician goes around and puts them right back on. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. I don't know. Well, Ellie, it's been a pleasure. Good luck to you, and uh, you know, uh, you, hopefully, Sean. I'll run into you. I know I got to go. I think I'll be going to Texas early awesome. next year. Awesome. I know you've so. been here. Well, you spent a few years here. So yeah, I spent about twenty years. I, you know, I trained at UTMB. You know, yep. just down the road down in Galveston, and so and uh, so I know exactly all the stuff. Well, here, if so. you come by, just uh, shoot me a message. Yeah. Will do. All right, guys. All right. You guys have a great Sunday, and everybody take care. I got to cook up some lobster. <laughs> <laughs> take care. Anyway, bye, guys. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.